So here we go. I can definitely see that it's a data sufficiency question, so I'm going to go ahead and write 1, 2, 10 instead of these, and you should be doing this on your scratch pad. Uh, 1, 2, 10, very good. Let's go ahead and take a moment. I'll give you 30 seconds to read the question. So this is a specific type of GMAT data sufficiency question called the yes-no question. And if you notice, they're not asking us for a number. They're just asking us, did the time to make all the parts exceed 250? Yes or no? We don't need to know what the number is, whether it's 251 or 249. We just need to know whether it exceeds 250 or it doesn't exceed. 250. So let's read the question and like we said, what are we going to do first? We're going to parse the language, we're going to break it down. Let's go ahead and do that. The time taken, and you can sort of do this as you're reading the question, and some of the situations will see me doing it literally as we read it for the first time. Um, with 100 parts made, so I just rewrite everything and make my own version of the question. With 100 parts made, 15 with basic, um, 45 with plus one specification and the remaining 40 and the remaining 40 with plus three specifications did the time to make all the automobile parts exceed 250 hours okay let's see plus 250 yes or no let's take a look at statement ones and I'm, this is everything you're seeing me doing here is what I'm doing on my GMAT scratch pad it takes one hour to make the part with basic, specific, basic specification, so one hour for basic. And with each additional specification, it takes 20 additional minutes. So to do a plus one, it would take uh, one hour or one and what, a third hours to do a plus one. And it would take, to do a plus three, it should take us two hours because one hour to make the basic parts and 20 minutes for each additional specification on, on plus three specifications, there's three additionals, so three times 20 will give us another hour, so two hours. So let's go back to these numbers. The question is, does it exceed 250? Well, to do all the basics, we've got 15 of them, that's 15 hours. To do all the plus ones, well, we've got 45 of them, so we need one and a third of those. Well, a third of 45 is 15, so add that to the 45, we should get 60. And then we are getting 20 that take two hours, that should give us 80. So if we add all these up, I'm pretty sure we get 155. So do the Additional, let's go back to the question. Do we need, did we need to know this exact number? We just need to know whether or not it exceeds 250. So now this is where sometimes people get a little confused on yes, no questions and they want to eliminate A because they think they're looking for the answer choice that gives them more than 250. But we're just trying to answer the question. Yes or no, does it exceed 250? Well, according to statement one, the answer is no. So statement one is sufficient to tell us, no, with this information, it does not exceed that. So when I know that the first statement alone is sufficient, this is the cool part. I can eliminate this one, I can eliminate this one, and I can eliminate this one. And I instantly have it down to a 50-50 situation. So it's important to do this process. We're a GMAT robot. Everything we did here had a reason. Write the 1, 2, 10, read the question, break it down, work the first statement. It's a yes, no question. The answer is no. We eliminate 2, T, and N. Um, and now we have the second statement to evaluate. Each part is made by two people and weighs two pounds. Well, we're trying to figure out how many hours it takes. So um, this is never going to get us at that number. So this is not going to give it to us. Statement one alone should be sufficient. Let's pick it and see what happens. Nice. Correct. 
we did a great job there. So there were a lot of pieces to that. We did the 1, 2, 10. We parsed the language of the, of the quantitative question. Notice how often the GMAT presents a quantitative question in a long verbal paragraph. Clearly, they're assessing our ability to um, manage the information there and literally turn it into math um, because they don't present it to us as math. So let's go ahead and take a look at another example um, of a data sufficiency question. We definitely have a data sufficiency question here. What is the area of the triangular region? So this is not a data sufficiency yes, no question like we just saw. This is actually asking us for what the area is. And anytime I get a question that has anything to do with areas, perimeters, circumferences, uh, anything like that, I always, as a GMAT robot, write the equation down. I don't even know if I'm going to need it. I just do it. So as soon as I hear the words area of a triangular region, I do area is equal to 1 half base times height. That's the equation for the area of a triangle. I just write it down. And then I continue reading. What is the area? That's what they want to know. They kind of want to understand what this area is. So if no, in number one, the length of AC, so like we said before, go ahead and draw things out. You can't draw on the screen at the GMAT. You should get used to doing this in your homework and in class. It took us less than 10 seconds to do that. They told us that the length of AC is 18. Okay, so 18, there we go. And the length of BD is 8. Look, they gave us the length of the base and the length of the height. I don't even need to put them in here. If I did, this equation would be done. I would know the area. So statement one is sufficient. We have our 1, 2, 10. Um, I know that we can get rid of this one. We don't need them together because one is sufficient and one is sufficient, so neither of them is not the right answer as well. Let's test out two. 2 says x equals 30. So they basically just give us the value of this number here. I don't know any of this. Um, and I'm supposed to get the area from just this. I don't think it's possible. Um, should be a, so pretty right, nice. So in this situation, just knowing the area of this one angle is not enough to tell us uh, the area of the whole triangle, but when they gave us the base and they gave us the height, that was enough. Great, let's see. Let's work one more data sufficiency before we look at some more properties of numbers. So if n is in, see, we're starting to see some variables in the questions and in the statements, um, and everyone let me know, is this a data sufficiency yes, no question, or is this a regular data sufficiency question? Is this a data sufficiency yes, no question? Tell me yes or no. Is it a data sufficiency yes, no? If n is an integer, is n minus 1 even? Looks like the answer they're looking for is either yes or no. So whenever I see variables, I start thinking, okay, I'm going to probably replace them. So the first thing you're gonna, I'm going to do is that, so I have a little placeholder to keep track of stuff. I use my paper to remember things. I don't use my brain to remember what value I came up with for n. I use my paper to remember that, or my scratch pad. If n is an integer, so I've got to follow that rule, is that I can't use 0.25. If n is an integer, is n minus 1 even? So they say n minus 2 is odd. Well, let's pick, up a, let's pick a number so that we can satisfy this condition. Let's say n equals 3. And 3 minus 2 equals 1. So yeah, that makes sense. I picked a number here that works. Um, n minus 2 is odd. Um, now, if I plug this value of n into here and ask myself, is it even, I get 3 minus 2, 1 equals 2, and the answer is yes, um, it is even. Good. Now, let's see if we can disprove this. Let's see if we can get a no, okay? Let's pick another number for n. 
Let's pick a number that satisfies this condition that when n minus 2, that n minus 2 is odd. So what's another number that could do that? Let's say 10. 10 minus 2 is 8. That's not odd, so we can't use that. Let's say 11. 11 minus, um, if n equals 11, then we have 11 minus 2 equals 9. Yep, that's odd. And if we plug that in over here to this original one to see if it's even, we get 11 minus 1 equals 10, and yes. I did it a couple times. There might be some edge cases out there. I can try numbers like 0 and 1 that have funky rules. Um, let's go ahead and try one more. Usually the second one to try should be 0 or 1. If we plugged in 0 here, 0 minus 2 is negative 2, and that's not odd, so that wouldn't work. If we plugged in 1, 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Let's try that out. If n equals 1, right, so n minus 2 would be, uh, what, 1 minus 2 equals negative 1. That's odd, so that's good. Let's plug it back into the original one to see. We have negative 1 minus 1 equals negative 2, and that's still even. The answer is yes. So this statement should be sufficient. Let's get rid of 2. Let's get rid of t. Let's get rid of n. And let's try the second statement. n plus 1 is even. So let's try these values again. Let's say n equals 3. Um, 3 plus 1 equals 4. That works. If we plug in n into the equation, we get what? Um, 3 minus 1 equals even. Yes. Good, that one works. Let's try 2. Everyone try another value for n on their own. Everyone try another value for n on their own. Try 1. So this was a good one. I plugged 1 in to see if it would screw it up. I get 1 plus 1 equals 2, so I met this condition, no problem. But when I plug 1 into this, um, 1 minus 1 is 0, and that's even. So it's a good thing we, re we learned that rule. 0 is even. The answer is still yes. I'm pretty sure that each statement alone is sufficient. Let's see if we're right. Nice work. So those are data sufficiency yes, no, and data sufficiency questions and the procedure for managing them, and we'll see more examples through the course. There is a couple of question types on the GMAT that they appear over and over again, testing our issues of averages, percents, and rate questions. And they all fall into the category of question types I call three things. There's always three things you have to find. They give you some of them. They don't give you all of them. They usually give you enough information to figure them out if you need to. Um, but remember, these questions always involve three things. So whenever you're working on an average, there's three things. There's the average. There's the total. And then there's the number of things. When you're working on percents, there's the percent, there's the number of things you're counting, and the total number of things. Remember, information management challenge. Keep track of the number of things you need, and keep track of the number of things you have, so that you know how many things you don't have, and so you know what you can figure out. And the GMAT loves questions with averages and percents and rates because it's a, they're great examples uh, for information management challenges. So let's just go ahead and jump in and take a look at some examples of these in the.